right, thank you so much and hello to everybody. Um, just to give a little background, I worked for two and a half decades in what has been framed as sustainable development, often with local organizations in, in Haiti, in West Africa, in South Asia, Central Africa, and East Africa. And I've also been um, really pulled in to um, humanitarian response recovery and um, complex emergencies in that work and over that time. I've also worked with international organizations such as Oxfam America, Oxfam International, um, the IRC, and um, Mercy Corps. So I have had some experiences in international NGOs and then, um, but the majority and particularly early stages, um, but ongoing have been with local organizations and national NGOs. Um, I've felt over the time of my work, especially um, in increasingly around 2004, five, six, seven, that um, climate change was an issue that we were not addressing and that was um, encompassing uh, most of the, if not all of the emergencies and high level disasters that we were experiencing at that time. And I wanted to increase my focus on climate change. And eventually what I wound up doing was I went back to University of Oxford um, and the Environmental Change Institute and Oxford um, University Center for Environment and um, undertook a DPhil courses study um, which enabled me to spend time um, studying emergent, pan, particularly pan-Asian um, networks that were local to local climate um, crisis and biodiversity loss crisis focused um, networks. And that includes um, the Global Eco-Village Network Oceana Asia, the Inter-Religious Climate and Ecology Network, which was started in Sri Lanka in um, in 2012, um, INEB, uh, which is the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, and um, several other networks that have been emergent and convergent in Asia, and many of them have uh, relationships and cooperative threads with local networks in, and particularly indigenous and local networks in Africa, and some increasing relationships in the UK, Europe, and the Americas. Um, so today I'd like to talk about some of the findings that came out of my research that really got started in 2012-13 and has been ongoing that has been emphasizing these climate and ecology networks um, and the, the focus on the regenerative markets that have been emerging. So in stories of COVID-19, I'm going to kind of work backwards in a way. And during, during this COVID lockdown all over the world, um, we have seen how rapidly the economic system has, um, has become vulnerable in some cases, in some communities has collapsed completely. Um, people have been living hand to mouth, if that, and have already been at the at, at an edge of vulnerability and at the margins and then with the shutdown, um, even if there was food existing, there, weren't, um, there wasn't money. Um, many people were forced into this, were displaced across India, Bangladesh, Thailand, Myanmar, um, and all over the world. And um, increasingly people have been starving um, because they, they didn't have the ability to purchase food because they didn't have income. Um, in, that has been largely rooted in a globalized economy and a service economy. Um, checking in um, from the early days and ongoing with affiliates of these networks and these market networks that I've been working with, um, the stories were actually stories of resilience and stories of strength and ability to support those in the wider community who did not have um, who were not already part of 
these initiatives that are um, regenerative, uh, regenerative food systems, permaculture, um, water systems, drought resistant, including um, areas that have developed water systems that are drought resistant for 40 days or more um, with lack of rain. Uh, there have been, in, in this picture here, we see um, what is called uh, a meta garden. And my friend Kanchana Virakon, who is the founder of EcoV Volunteers in Sri Lanka and Edible Routes in Delhi, um, she's right there in the center of the picture. And she worked with a number of temples to help them develop um, meta gardens, organic gardens, and permaculture systems in their temples. And what was very interesting is at the moment of the lockdown, most of these temples rely upon dana for their food. Um, dana would be the, the, what the, the service, the donation that communities bring daily um, to the monks for them to eat. And people weren't able to come and give dana and people also didn't have, um, increasingly had less to give. And what the temples found, um, this is in India and in Sri Lanka, is that they were able to enjoy healthy organic food and had food security because of the, the uh, gardens that EcoV and Edible Routes had been um, helping them develop over time. But they also found that they were in a position of strength um, to share their food with wider communities who had whose access to food had been shut off cut off um, so this is one example of um, a bigger story of resilience that has been building over many years um, they I'm sorry the eco bricks is also they've continued to do online curriculum and teaching of a variety of ecological sustain, ecologically sustainable zero waste and regenerative and permaculture and biodiversity restoration practices. So they've been strong and they have been able to help strengthen those around them as well. Um, this is a photograph of some monks in an eco temple, um, and that is a fully sustainable eco temple built there with a, a sufficiency economy um, system built up around it um, in Thailand. And these monks have, you know, anyone who was in, in the community at the time of the lockdown stayed in the community at the time of the lockdown, and they've continued with their planting, their harvesting, their natural build work, and um, continue to share um, teachings with their larger sangha, their larger, larger community, and anyone online um, with their practices of sufficiency economy, permaculture, natural build, and energy systems. Um, some other examples of the system, systems of resurgence, adaptability, and resilience during the time of COVID that has come from these networks. Um, in Hawaii, um, there's an indigenous um, community that is part of the Pan-Asian Interreligious Climate and Ecology Network called Living Life Source Foundation, and they practice um, their traditional moon, lunar calendar um, water uh, watershed mountain to ocean management of her, what we could call a uh, traditional ecological knowledge that fits very well within permaculture systems and they have um, because they've been able to be harvesting over this period of time and largely the indigenous community 60 percent of the homeless population in hawaii is indigenous and most of them the indigenous community in Hawaii is living on the margins and among some of the most vulnerable. Um, and people had been starving because they were reliant upon the social systems for support that was um, experiencing a gap. And they also had lost those, most of them who were in service economy jobs around tourism, this um, tourism had been cut off. They were starving and Living Life Source Foundation has been distributing food continuously and then bringing in more people to um, from physical distancing, but um, into learning about their own indigenous wisdom for um, 
food pr for food production and um, water and ecological management systems. So it's another example of resilience. Um, the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, along with the ICE Network, raised more than $50,000 through their extended local-to-local -local network um, that was able to then bring emergency relief, and they distributed resources through the localized networks in India, Bangladesh, Nepal, Myanmar, Thailand, and actually in Colorado to some of the most vulnerable people in those areas, and particularly those who've been displaced um, with, with some of the lockdown policies that just uh, did not take into consideration um, my, migrant populations in the area. Um, some other examples as the Thai, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned that the Thai temples have been coordinating with the Thai government for distributing food, water, and medicine to all of their local um, communities, villages, and within, like in Bangkok and in Chiang Mai, um, because most people, there's such a severe cut in income um, due to the loss of the service economy and the shutdown. But again, we had a high number of people who didn't have access to food. And so the government was rerouting food from, um, in particular, some of the organic and permaculture networks, and then at the larger scale as well from, from the market, from the grocery stores, into the temples and the temples were distributing. Um, so the networks that are set up through these um, communities have been very resilient and responsive during time of emergency and shock. Um, there are quite a few other examples. Um, this is my friend um, Tino in Myanmar who is stock taking their food sovereignty and food security um, in the early weeks of COVID-19 and they're happy and comfortable and enjoying themselves and also able to be a presence of stability um, for a network of villages in their region. Um, and this is just a quote that uh, this comes to uh, capture in many ways the essence of the regenerative markets and economy that have come through um, these interreligious climate and ecology networks and these local to local um, spiritual ecology networks is we have to ask ourselves what do I need rather than what do I want or desire. Jeez, these are some other examples. This is um, the Gaia Ashram on the Thai Lao border, which has um, they took advantage of the lockdown to set up their cafe and a lot of the goods that they um, produce from their permaculture and traditional ecological um, knowledge and eco-village practices. They have, when they can't distribute them across Thailand, then they're setting up for the cafe and they're finding ways to um, still um, sell things online and also share their curriculum of practices, which includes um, watershed management, um, organic transitioning, permaculture, food forest, um, sustainable and renewable energy and um, eco-build practices. So there, I even though I've sort of stepped backwards into what's been happening in these networks, and I'll talk a little bit more about the beginnings of them, what you can see is that there are foundations of capabilities, endogeneity, and eco-cultural rooted markets that are um, present within these Pan-Asian networks. I'm going to skip, we spent a lot of time in this past week talking about um, what I would call the um, industrial growth society model. It's also what Joanna Macy would call it. Um, and some of, some of the dominant um, growth-based, exponential growth-based markets that we're dealing with in society, because I want to focus more on what has been emerging and what already exists, so models of practice, models of action that can inspire, catalyze others, and also bring those in through a transition and into new systems markets. Um, so I actually don't even like to use the word development, um, but I will kind of bring out some of the language of development, exogenous development, and endogenous development, and um, I would like to propose instead that we consider what is locally emerging um, well-being engagement. 
um, but Susan Holcomb um, talks about um, endogenous development as uh, participatory approaches that come from within communities that build on local institutions, cultures, capacity, and local ownership. And the um, exogenous development is, as we know, it tends to come um, from centralized, top-down, um, usually driven from um, and determined mission and purposes and goals from well outside of the communities and the cultures tend to be standardized and we even see that with the sustainable development goals, although there is some opening and porousness within those. Um, and um, the idea of development traditionally has, since the second um, industrial revolution of the 1950s has been about exponential economic growth. Um, but in these networks, um, while there is uh, a range of Buddhist, Hindu, Christian, um, a great variety of indigenous values that have come into these uh, networks, there is a strong foundation of Buddhist economics and gross national happiness. And some of our early, earlier speakers have talked about gross national happiness in the network that I've been working with, um, some people in Satira Kosa Nagapradipa Foundation and the International Network of Engaged Buddhists, which has, um, which was started by um, Ajahn Sulak Sivaraksa, who is a Thai activist and thinker and uh, troublemaker. <laughs> he's been, he speaks <laughs> truth to power and he's been in exile and arrested and lots of his students have also experienced a lot of um, uh, a lot of pressures from the existing power systems, but under Satira Kosa Naga Pradipa Foundation, a number of organizations have emerged um, independently yet affiliated. Um, so they're in community and relationship, but they um, are not in a centralized um, top-down sort of formation. They emerge and they support and collaborate each other with each other, but they are not um, predetermining or controlling what the other organizations do. So under SNF and INAB, there was a meeting with the Kingdom of Bhutan in 2007 um, that led to a conference around gross national happiness between Thai community activists and Bhutanese leadership around gross national happiness. Um, from that, what was inspired and started by 2011 was the School for Wellbeing, which decided to be, it was a think tank, it still is, a think tank to explore concepts of DNH and well-being in Asian societies and what people there are determining for themselves what well-being means to them. And they decided that they needed to move that into practice. And moving that into practice meant the formation of what's called Towards Organic Asia. And it has been a community to community um, collaborative experiential learning um, movement across Southeast Asia that has been supporting farmers to transition into organic food, forest, and permaculture um, practices and those who are further along in the process. So if someone has transitioned to organic farming 10 years ago and there's a, there's a village of farmers that is beginning and one year in, they'll have a number of exchange visits. And it could be within Thailand, it could be between Thailand and Myanmar, farmer to farmer from Sri Lanka um, to Vietnam and so on. And so there's been a collaborative learning from the experiences of the farmers themselves. And that has then built a network of, um, so the, the producers, the organic producers needed to, first they began with niche markets. And then what they did was they started to support each other in building relationships with consumers in the cities and markets in the cities. And then they themselves began to um, establish community cooperative restaurants, community cooperative stores, um, green hotels in the cities and towns where it, so they would also be sourcing and then the organic farmers um, with their increasing yields were still 
really um, the the demand for their for their products um, became greater in, in, than what they were producing because the network has become so great, um, so large, and uh, much of a kind of a web across Southeast Asia. From these groups that have not only has it it began with food, it began with the basics: food, water, well, sustainable well-being, and re, uh, regenerative well-being. Um, there began to be more of a, you know, cooked food, um, processed, you know, developing beauty products, health products, healing um, from herbs, and more the traditional healing practices in those areas. And those also then moved into the shops and the cooperatives um, across the area. And so, so you can find in Thailand, for example, I can find products from across the network in Southeast Asia in the different shops, although local um, are given primacy. So you, first you'll find Thai and then you'll find other exchanges um, with Vietnam, with Myanmar, Sri Lanka, and so on. Um, I also wanted to note that it, uh, Chula Longhorn Right Livelihoods and the Right Livelihoods Laureate Program is another spinoff from this movement and it's about educating and lar largely you'll see like farmers from small villages, young students um, from all over the area are engaging in participatory action research and, um, and developing their skills in learning and understanding right livelihoods by joining with a lot of these farmers and producers and hoteliers and restaurants and learning about what's been developing in these markets and part of in their payment for being part of these experiential education programs is that they then must take a project back into their own communities and then with the support of this growing network they move that forward and Tino, um, who is back here, he was in the Curls Right Livelihoods program, and he ended up um, working with his village and a network of villages in the surrounding area to transition to organics and then to bring in natural build and permaculture techniques. Um, so, and this was, it happens rather rapidly, and one can find quite a few um, examples of quick regeneration and change once. Um, students of all ages have come into some of the experiential education work on these um, organic and transitioning um, communities. Uh, so I don't, we have talked about gross national happiness before and there are metrics that have emerged um, and Sabine Alkair at um, OFI in Oxford has been working very closely with the Kingdom of Bhutan on developing GNH metrics. Um, and it's been important for Bhutan to develop that uh, in, in the networks in Thailand, Thailand and Laos and across this Asian, um, Asian uh, market and social change movement. Um, they're less interested in metrics and they're much more interested in self-determination and a critical examination of systems that have been destructive to their lives and then asking the question of what makes you happy and see if I can just, I'm only going to, I'll share the, the video um, is linked there, but if I can, open this up for a minute. I hope, is everybody seeing the video right now? Can you see the video? Uh, no, okay, I think I need to, maybe I stop share and try the, see if I can, I'm sorry about that, because it's on a separate link. Um, if I can. PowerPoint is not good. No, that's that's the challenge. So I'm going to see if I can. Okay. 
Can everybody see this now? The video? No? Yes, I think we should. It should work now. Okay, great. So this video is actually, it was made by a friend of mine um, who is the executive director of Project in Laos. And his name is Samba Sampon. And um, he, with his grassroots organization that focus on ecological regeneration and right livelihoods in Laos, um, they developed this video where they went and talked to a wide span of people and um, different urban and rural spaces and asked them in a rapidly changing economy in Laos, mind you, um, what it what happiness means to them. And this was part of raising the question of self-determination and, and consideration of what is happiness and gross national happiness. So I'll just play a couple minutes of this. Okay, so I hope everybody could see the subtitles for that. Um, and to contextualize this, Samba was part of the startup of the ICE network. And he, um, maybe two, two weeks after the organization of what launched the ICE network in Sri Lanka. He was back in Laos and he was disappeared by police. And um, his wife was in a car in front. There was a video that actually showed the, um, the police picking him up, um, even though they, they and the government denied that this happened and he has been missing ever since and presume that he probably is no longer alive and all he was doing was working with students and community groups on learning about ecological regeneration and asking questions about asking people to ask themselves about what makes them happy and what is well-being in their lives so while we're talking about what I consider some very beautiful ideas, they are a threat to existing power structures, especially in my opinion, when those power structures are weakening, um, when they're weakening and when they're being challenged, um, when their perpetuation is being challenged, the oppression tends to heighten. And we see that with Sulak Sivaraksa in Thailand and the student groups there. And we see that in, in this example with Samba. So he's asking the questions of what makes you happy and what is well-being. And that is um, apparently a threat to the Lao government. Um, so I do want to talk a bit about ecocultures and this idea of um, industrial growth society is often interpreted as a Western construct and a Western culture, um, when in reality, in the UK, in Europe, in the Americas, all over the world, we have had thousands of years of a myriad of evolving and present ecocultures where human beings, the relationship um, of their idea of nature, of ecology and human culture in that relationship is very different than what we see within um, consumption-based, growth-based, um, dominant pyramid. I don't know if people are familiar with the idea that 
the, um, the top 1% at the top of the pyramid of humans who are subjugating, exploiting, and um, using as resources humans and non-humans on the globe. That is one eco-cultural relationship, but there is a vast variety over millennium, complete, con continuing to evolve of eco-cultures around the planet. They are present. They are in indigenous cultures. They are in African, a wide range of African cultures that have shifted and merged and influenced each other in Asian cultures in Europe and, and the Americas and Australia. So um, it's important that we recognize that these cultures are not something new coming up, but the consciousness and awareness and recognition of them is raising. And outside of, outside of societies that have not been fully saturated with the values of um, exponential economic growth and industrial um, growth society, um, there has not, there's not as much work to be done to bring in some of these eco-cultural relationships that um, often see humans as part of nature and see a re responsibility to the care and stewardship of our ecology and natural worlds. And um, many of those are found in the world's religions. Um, this is an old study from the Pew Research Center. I didn't find an update, um, but 84% of the world's human population self-identifies as belonging to a world, uh, major world religion. We can talk about the diversity of cultures and ego cultures that exist across these religions. Um, and it is, of course, not, not simple to, to cast a net across world religions. And you cannot say that the people think all one way. There is great diversity from one temple to another, one church to another, but still there's a, that represents um, a vast span of people who are um, engaged in spiritual and faith practice, but may have, or that does have foundations of um, ecological responsibility and a sense of interconnection and interbeing. Um, approximately 476 million indigenous people um, are on the planet worldwide in over 90 countries. And over the years, um, there has been a syncretism of indigenous wisdom, practices, cultures, beliefs within some of the dominant world religions, particularly we can see in Buddhism. Um, and the indigenous populations worldwide are current, they're evolving, they're present, they're modern and yet they carry their traditional practices with them. I raised this because the foundation of these Pan-Asian networks and the networks and markets comes from um, a spiritual ecology, sacred ecology, deep ecology, um, a sense of the, the a sacred relationship between the human and the humans to each other and humans to um, the rest of the natural world of which they're a part. I'm talking about this for the markets, not only because these market networks view markets as something that has existed well along um, a three or 400 year experiment in the industrial revolution and recognize that markets are a social construct that have existed since our memory, at least, of human society. And um, that means if it's a social construct that we can collaboratively determine what values we wish to embed within our markets. We can create our markets and we can do it from um, these initiatives of building new systems and transitional market systems that care for the well-being of each other, right livelihoods, the well-being, right ecology, um, well-being and recovery and regeneration of nature. And that's been kind of a root of root value within these networked markets that are local to local yet expanding across Asia and more and more globally. Um, and I bring up just the concept of the Lamarckian evolution, not only in terms of how there's the experiences of environment and relationship um, impacts the genes and impacts the makeup of 
a system of a human system, an ecosystem of an earth system, um, but they're also continuously evolving. And the markets that I'm sharing with you today are also continuously evolving. Um, they are in a process of a evolution. There are Buddhist economic roots, but particularly to the Good Market and the Mindful Markets Forum, which came with the Towards Organic Asia. Um, and as we have the Schumacher namesake, I think there's something very fitting in this relationship um, where E.F. Schumacher coined the terminology and the, of, of Buddhist economics in Small is Beautiful, and it was inspired from his time in Myanmar and his time in Southeast Asia. Um, and Buddhist economics is something, even if the language might have been framed um, in the UK, that many people in these networks speak to now. And um, they, they often use the language of small is beautiful, um, the, the, starting with the healing of the self, the healing of the family, the community, and looking at well-being through that way. And that includes the formation of markets. Um, I'm going to skip a little bit here. Um, and we'll be sharing, I can share this um, with that people if they'd like to see. Um, if they'd like to reference it. But patterns, processes, and um, pathways, this is something that Jennifer Parker, Jennifer Hinton, and I developed recently about some of the patterns that we're seeing in the Asian, for me, within the Asian network markets, um, for, for Jennifer and Jennifer in, um, in European and UK um, emergent markets. And it is about asking the question of what is good, what is success, what is well-being. There's an emphasis on collaboration and cooperation instead of competition across the markets. It's about reciprocity and responsibility. Um, there's a co-creation um, in the social construct of the markets, co-determining values and pra practices within the markets. Um, so they're coming in with shared values of concern, but not forcing either a singularity um, rather, there's a unity through diversity. The health of the markets are reflected through the collaborative social ecological biodiversity. Um, the relationships, um, the human systems are embedded in part of ecosystems um, in that interdependence and interbeing and relational dynamics. Um, and the emphasis and the value is not just, it is not about while there can be profit, um, that is not the bottom line. It's not about um, uh, quarterly reports to shareholders um, illustrating profit margins. It's rather about you know, how are we in terms of our physical health, in terms of our spiritual health, in terms of our ecological health. Do we, do we have what we need and can we manage and be strong and resilient to shocks as they emerge? Um, from the networks, that um, they are beyond the markets, but the markets have sprung up through them and the markets behave in the same way. There is um, kind of a pattern of formation that begins with, I, I called it ritual and religion um, in, in homage to Roy Rappaport. It's, it's really, it's, it's the, the beginning with the belief, um, with the listening, with um, growing awareness and responsiveness to self and nature. Um, and then it moves into education for social change and really critically engaging, looking at the root causes of suffering, looking at the um, looking at the power systems and structures of the existing governmental and economic um, globalized systems and the harm that's being caused to the planet, harm that's being caused to communities, the vulnerability it creates, the poverty it creates. And then from that envisioning a path forward, and the edu experiential education we make the road by walking becomes um, we're identifying, and this is in ref um, this is a reference that the network has made in Asia to a 1933 Miles Horton Highlander School that also seated the movements of the labor movement in the U.S., the civil rights movement in the U.S., and the environmental movement in the U.S. So here they are referencing that and their relationships between King and Thich Nhat Hanh, who is in this group, and Sulak Sivaraksa. So you see that there's been an exchange of ideas that's been emerging. And 
the Highlander School and the Experiential Education, Educational um, for Social Change engagement in these networks is about people looking at here are the problems we are facing, here's what we'd like to learn, okay, let's figure out how to learn it together. And let's figure out then how to create the models that work for us and then also share what doesn't work, recognizing the, re the mistakes and the problems and bringing those up as well is valuable. Um, so it's a very different model than we see in the top-down development and humanitarian systems. And from that, then, then the experimental creative applications of the learning um, bring more people in. Um, it's illustrating the model of action, but it's also then bringing tangible change um, within people's lives and helping transition and build new systems. Um, and from that, then there's a modeling, facilitating, connecting. And a lot of these people in these networks um, have not only uh, the emphasis is on sharing across their communities and leveraging shared knowledge and practice, and then also helping problem solve um, and, and raising the capabilities that they have to share across the entirety of the networks. And more broadly, they see it as a collaborative, cooperative engagement then, and that the, if there is competition, it's with the old system, the old um, economic de um, development and growth-based economy that they see is dying and the need to collaborate with anyone who's engaging with building up these new markets and these new systems. Um, so they're sharing and learning with each other, but they're also, um, one monk got um, elected as a senator in Sri Lanka on the platform of climate change and ecology um, and regenerative practices that came through and from these networks. Um, many of these um, faith and community leaders have joined in climate talks and they met with the president of France, they've met with the head of UNFCCC, um, they have shared their stories, but they've, it's as a modeling of this is what we're doing. If you'd like to come along and learn, not coming saying we're asking this of you, but saying this is what we're doing and it, it would be good for you to come and join us and support this. Um, so participants in the new economy, I know I don't have a lot of time left, so I'm going to try to move quickly through this. Um, they're voluntarily operating according to these new rules, minimize harm of current systems, support new economy enterprises, reduce the concentration of power, and support the new system and transition. Um, we've had some people talk about old story and new story. This is a little bit more of that. Um, we have an old story that <laughs> life is nasty, brutal, brutal and short. And um, there's been a separation from nature. Nature is something to commodify, to exploit, to use natural resources. Um, there's been even a relationship then to nature-based religion. Traditional ecological knowledge has been captured within, um, within um, a, a marginalized, non-Christian, non and I, I say this from the industrial revolution and feudalistic origins um, where nature is demonized and the wisdom and knowledge that comes from nature-based spirituality has also been demonized. So this is part of the old story um, that we've looked at quite a bit, the, the hierarchy, the top-down approach, the prescribed exogenous development. And in the new story, we are seeing how that... Um, it's, it's about looking at how humans are inherently social. We, we like to collaborate. We like to be with each other and um, make each other healthier and stronger. And nature is that way as well. And we are part of that. Nature is collaborative. Um, create values and enable um, humans to thrive within planetary boundaries. It's a... Um, so I'm, I'm going to move forward a little bit because I realized I wanted to fill up the hour and I haven't even gotten through. <laughs> um, so, but what we're talking about is a new story and the new economic story is still emerging, but it is happening. This is not just, we're not just in a theory space. We're already, and this is 
not just in the Asian network. Um, we're seeing responsible businesses, CCCs, B Corps, zebra movements, intentional communities, civic organizations, voluntary networks, um, and it's in, in evolutionary evolutionary economists are recognizing and coming up with complex adaptive systems that behave much in the way that this network behaves that I've been talking about and that the markets in the network behave. And what that is, is um, it's behaving if, if the foundations of the networks and the collaboration are that humans are part of nature and as part of nature, we need to be responsive and collaborate. Then we begin, then the networks themselves and the markets themselves begin to behave um, in the way that a healthy ecosystem would behave and ecosystems linking through ecotones and into a larger earth system. So what is emerging in these new system models of economics and particularly strengthened through networks and network platforms um, is actually a market system that mirrors embedded and is embedded within a harmonious, um, healthy earth system and ecology. And that is where I see um, a lot of the transitioning taking place. Um, there are a lot of models for engagement. I'm going to talk about a few here and I'm happy to share um, more information um, later with the group, um, but the sufficiency economy, um, system in Thailand, the Mindful Markets Forum Network on Southeast Asia um, that I've spoken about, about already, and the Good Market. Um, the Good Market emerged out of Sri Lanka and um, is now global. So sufficiency economy in Thailand, this is um, a drone shot of an eco temple that is part of the larger networks and that really emphasizes and models um, sufficiency economy practices all around Thailand and increasingly um, in neighboring countries through the network. Um, and this, prior to this work, this was a very arid um, conventional farming space. And this, the build, the water systems, the food systems all have come up in the past um, 10 years in particular. Um, so sufficiency economy um, is in Thailand, it comes from Nong Na Na. Um, it's a model with four benefits. So you have 30, 30, 30, um, or they say three, three, three. Um, so you have protected water spaces, you have reforestation or you know, space for forest, often it's reforestation or it's protecting an existing forest. And then for restored land and that restored land is often um, where you may have permaculture, um, organics and um, food system and then 10% for shelter. And this is something that actually came from the, form, the, the present king's father, King Bonibog of Thailand. And it was a philosophy of um, sufficiency economy. And it, it really comes from the traditional systems within Thai villages. And you'd have a hilltop where the, the house and the storage for food, the shelter, um, maybe where if you had any um, chickens or animals there, they're up at the top of the hill. And then you come down and you have kind of the protect the, the food, the sustainable or renewable restored land and food systems. Below that, you'd have the forest and then the water. And it was a way of kind of having a natural watershed. Oftentimes the water would surround um, the land and it would bring balance and living. It was a philosophy of sufficiency, but it was also a philosophy of a long-term vision of survival, um, well-being, and resilience in the communities. Um, this is uh, Prasong Kong. Um, he's a very engaged um, member of INEV ICE Network and uh, Global Eco Village Network and the Eco Temples. And he is um, an advocate of the sufficiency economy um, strategy. And he has been working with communities all over Thailand to help them, especially in villages, but also in, to some areas in towns and cities where there is space to create it 
but to replicate this kind of um, nung 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 um, sufficiency economy strategy. And they, a lot of these groups then have been engaging in the larger mindful markets forum network and the global, um, the, uh, the good market um, network. So they're building, um, they're building a market web. And this is something that I should, I will, I'll bring up with them. Um, I'll talk when I'm talking a little bit more about the good market, but the web is essential. It's not just that they're developing individual businesses, but it is the building the relationships across sectors of, um, of production, of transport, of um, consumers and consumer relationships themselves. Um, in many of these um, networks and markets, consumers will actually go and join with producers and learn and they'll learn about like um, I joined several that were in uh, along the southern coastline in Thailand, where sustainable fisheries were meeting with consumers from Bangkok, and they went out into the waters and they talked about, here's what's happening with climate change, here's our vulnerability, and then they had three-day workshop where together the consumers and the producers tried to develop um, solutions together. So the relationships are different. Um, it, across the, the web of these mindful markets. Um, let's see, I know I'm at nine o'clock, if you don't mind, if I, or sorry, I'm, I'm at the one hour point, I would like to share a little bit more about the good market. Could I have 10 more minutes to do that? Okay, great, thanks. So, um, so the good market. Um, the good market actually emerged from uh, 20 years ago. I was working with the Sri Lanka Foundation in the conflict zone in Sri Lanka, and there was a huge, um, I mean, most of the conflict zone had been decimated, and um, the environment was destroyed by, um, by the fighting, the wars, the mines, and um, you know, the bombs and also elephants that were displaced. Um, so there's a lot of ecological destruction in the area. And in Sri Lanka, um, my friends and I were working, and Sri Lanka is a Sri Lankan NGO, we're working with displaced communities who had returned to the area and there was no economy existing. Um, and they were starting to try to do what they traditionally had done, which was, you know, basically monocropping according to extensive uh, um, agricultural extension services and fishing. And they were very vulnerable because they, um, the price setting was done um, in Colombo or globally um, by buyers. And there was just no space for them to recover economically, but also they were um, trying to pick up in an ecologically devastated region. And, we had started with SEVA societies where people were kind of starting to develop, well, we can make these things and these are some ecological foundations to the way we want to do it so that we can recover our, our food systems and have kind of a healthy environment. And we quickly realized that niche marketing wasn't going to work. Organics weren't going to work in a niche marketing way um, without building up a web and an, um, a market web of relationship, relational collaboration, and that it was a much bigger exercise that had to bring in everybody, um, uh, bring everybody who's, who's willing and able to start to build um, a new market system. And that was kind of the seed of the good market. And it officially, I mean, this was, these were conversations in 2003, four, and five, and seven, and officially this was launched in 2012 after the ICE Network um, first conference in Anuradhapura in Sri Lanka. Um, and just in eight years time, they have um, gotten extremely strong in Sri Lanka and now have expanded to a global platform. Um, I'd like to do a little bit of I'm going to shut, stop. I think I had to stop share and then reshare. Um, I hope you don't mind, but I think it's worth to see this. 
Um, I don't think that's coming through though. Hold on. Um, sorry about that. Okay. Can everybody see that all right? Yep. That's fine. Okay. Okay, so this is the good market. Okay, good. so the good market, um, I need to do the screen share again, sorry. Um, okay. So the good market began in Sri Lanka and um, they started with the organic transitioning and kind of community mobilization and engagement and building the markets and people kind of determining in circular economy, upcycling, that sort of thing. But as you can see, it's expanded. Um, there are multiple shops, physical shops and open market events across the country. Um, and there's now a global platform. Um, they are distinct yet related and the global platform as the, the national network continues um, and the, the physical markets continue, the global platform is reflecting a lot of the network formation that I've been talking about from the ICE network, from Global Eco Village Network, from INEV, SNF, um, and Good Market's been a part of this. And it's this idea of a self-organizing global movement that behaves in the way that a healthy social ecosystem does. So markets and networks that are collaborative, the mutual co-arising that, and as we know in ecosystems, some things that are not healthy and don't work, they fall off and something else emerges, but it's a constant flux equilibrium of evolution. And the good market is working to facilitate this and they have a vision of expanding this and has already been expanded um, so across Asia, um, into Africa, into the UK and Europe and North America and South and Central America currently. And they're building clusters. And it's, it's a process that the more people who come in, who join, um, the stronger and more dynamic it will be. And this is part of an, their investment and interest to this curated platform um, is about building the transition and the new systems um, with a view that the dominant 20th century um, exponential growth based ec economic system is not sustainable, cannot be held within the planetary boundaries. It is, create, it is the root cause of poverty, of inequality, of injustice of um, climate change and so this is about building that transition and new system and it, doing so through a platform that is facilitating a similar kind of network as we're seeing in the larger climate and ecology networks and local to local cooperation so on the right you see the good market um, their real retail shops marketplace events team, um, organization operations team and then the good market global 
its community outreach team, a curation team, which is really it's facilitating, supporting, um, supporting the market and the, the, the people who are uh, on the platform and the operations team. Um, it's been really great that this emerged through the Sri Lankan community. It's something where there's um, lessons learned and an endogenous engagement from a very diverse um, community that knows, a uh, society that knows, um, they know trouble, they know complex emergencies, um, and, uh, it, and they know resilience and recovery and building new, new systems collaboratively. Um, so this has been a great place as a starting point for the good market, and it's come from Sri Lankans. Um, and there's a lot of space then for learning um, around the world, not to replicate exactly, for instance, what's emerging in the Sri Lankan market, but recognizing that within a social, a healthy social ecosystem of a market, the more diverse we are, but the more, and yet collaborative and supportive, the stronger we'll be, the healthier we'll be. And so there's space for us to be who we need to be um, without being in competition with each other. Um, some of the lessons coming from Sri Lanka, social inclusion, teamwork, networks, language, access, um, access as well to the technology, which um, is becoming, it has, it has a razor's edge issue with uh, technology, but that is part of the learning. Um, you've got people from multiple religions, languages, background. Um, you've got a great disparity in, um, in income and um, between the rural and urban populations and a wide um, range of sectors um, that have been engaging in the market. Um, the, this new economy story um, utilizes preferential, preferential sourcing through those within the good market. So it's another aspect of volunteering. Um, the community members, they source products and services from each other. So they're building the market um, through the relationships with each other and through these platforms. Um, they're strengthening each other and creating it as they go. Um, so the platform was tested in Sri Lanka and there are 1,200 enterprises across 37 countries now. So from the time of the launch in 2012 to 2019, it has expanded really rapidly. Um, I'll skip ahead a little bit here because I just, for the last bit, in terms of the new economy, we need facilitators, we need networks, we need pollinators. Um, we need low barrier to entry, but then we ratchet up our standards. We have a shared common basis to entry, and then we support each other in the market to increase the standards from packaging to process to transport. Um, and I'm just going to skip ahead for the last bit that I wanted to talk about. So if we kind of step back from the Good Market, Mindful Markets Forum, Genoa, the Sufficiency Economy Networks, um, the Zero Waste Networks. This is, these are models and examples of something that's already happening for transitioning and new system markets and economy. We do have challenges. We have to consider how are we bridging the gap? Um, how are we helping <laughs> making the road by walking and bringing people in? Um, there's a real, burden on reporting administration. There's um, in the old charity aid system, there's not a lot of flexibility. There aren't resources that can come into this in the same way and could un undermine. Um, we also need to consider transitional and new market systems where in our existing systems and policy and um, individual and group engagement in the network and resource investments, can we help strengthen and build this transition and bring more people in to the new system as we know that we are going to be experiencing a massive global economic recession and we are in the midst of a growing ecological crisis, uh, earth systems crisis right now, and we are going to be undergoing a number of shocks. How do we build the transition 
and strengthen these new market systems um, as as we are going to be under, undergoing so much so many shocks and so much difficulty. So I just wanted to kind of bring this into the idea of the tipping point. Um, I don't know if people have seen this graphic before, but the idea is that you have to start with the early innovators um, and you get the early adopters. So the innovators are the ones who are making the road by walking. They're breaking into new ground and trying to, to, to um, trying the new experiment. And the, then those who start to come in as the early adopters, you usually have a break between them and the early majority. But as people start seeing the need for the new models of action, the new market systems, the more they're going to start to come in. And it's when you start to get the early majority and the diffusion of the in innovation, you get those 34% of the early majority, you hit a tipping point. So the focus, it's not helpful to focus on the laggards and the late majority, um, especially those, the laggards who, who are resistant. Um, that's a lot of wasted energy. Um, if they come along at all, they're going to be at the last and it's well after a tipping point. So we focus, we focus on the front part of this graph until we build an early majority and have a tipping point. And that is where we can build systems change. And there can be policy that can make space for it. And some, some considerations are what can universal basic income do to support this? What can online P2P um, investment directly to new fledgling and um, ecologically rooted businesses do through these markets? And what are some other creative ways to build each other up without having it be necessarily fiscally based? Um, so I've gone on for very long here. I'm going to um, thank you for your patience and your time. Um, and if anyone wants to go back to any of the